Hi, welcome to Topology. I'm your host, Clark Barwick. This is one of the few times that you'll actually see my face this semester, because most of what we're going to be doing is going to be taking place online, and I'll be off camera. But I thought you might like to see the face of the guy who's going to be talking to you all semester. Hi there. Now let's get to work. Today our topic is going to be closeness. In topology, we are usually interested in getting rid of the notion of distance, but preserving the idea of closeness. So today we're going to understand what the notion of closeness that we want to preserve is, and how it operates. So to begin, let's imagine that we have two points, x and y, in the same Euclidean space, Rn. What could it mean to say that x and y are close? Here are two points on the real line, and we can ask, are these two points close? Well, you might think those two points are close, and I might think that they're not close, and there's no real way for us to decide who's right and who's wrong. The answer depends on our standards. So our question is, if the answer depends on our standards, how do we formalize that mathematically? Well, the standard in question is an epsilon greater than zero for us. We can say that x and y are epsilon close if and only if the distance between them is strictly less than epsilon. So for example, if you've chosen epsilon to be three, then you're quite happy that the point zero, one in the real line are three close. But if I've chosen the epsilon of one half, then I'm no longer happy that zero and one are one half close. This is fine, but unfortunately it means that the only way that everyone can agree on whether x and y are close is if they're just equal. That is, the following two conditions are equivalent. One, for every epsilon greater than zero, x and y are epsilon close. And two, x just equals y. That means that the only absolute notion of closeness between points is equality. That is absurd. Why are we talking about closeness if it's the same thing as equality? There is an absolute notion of closeness, but it's not between a point and another point of Euclidean space. Rather, it's between a point and a subset of Euclidean space. Here's that definition. A point x in Rn is going to be said to be close to a subset s of Rn if and only if, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point, s in s, whose distance away from x is less than epsilon. In other words, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point that's epsilon close to x. Here's an example. We're going to think about the subset s of R2, so this is sitting inside the plane, and we're going to think about the points that are of distance strictly less than 2 from the origin. And now we're also going to contemplate the point x here, whose coordinates are root 2 and root 2. And of course, its distance from the origin is exactly 2. So x is definitely not an element of s. Nevertheless, x is close to s. That is, if you look at every epsilon greater than 0, and you look at the points that are epsilon close to x, then among those points is inevitably some point of s. OK, so now we're ready to introduce some notation for this. If x is a subset of Rn and s is a subset of x, then we're going to write tau xs for the subset of x consisting of those points that are close to our s. This subset is called the closure of S. Let's rewrite the definition of the closure in a different way. First, we'll define this subset of Rn. This is the ball of radius epsilon centered at x. This consists of the points of Rn with the property that they are epsilon close to our fixed x. It's going to permit us to write down a formula for our closure. The closure of s in x is the set of points in x that are close to our s. 
That is to say, it's the set of points x and x such that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is some s and s whose distance from x is strictly less than epsilon. Now when I'm going to write this thing as an intersection or a union, I'm going to just follow my, the following rules. I'm going to remember that a universally quantified sentence corresponds to an intersection, and an existentially quantified sentence corresponds to a union. So when I say for every epsilon greater than zero, that means I'm taking the intersection over all possible epsilons greater than zero. And when I say that there exists an s and s, then I'm taking the union over all those s's and s's. And then I'm looking for those points that are within epsilon of that s. In other words, I'm looking for the ball of radius epsilon around s, and I'm intersecting that with our x. Notice, by the way, that this intersection with x could happen deep inside this formula as we like, or I can pull it all the way out here and have it on the outside. If I do that, then I'm left with the closure of s in Rn itself intersected with x. So let's watch this formula in action in the following example. Here I have a triangle, and in this triangle I'm not going to include this edge, and I'm not going to include this vertex. Both of those are excluded from my triangle, but everything else in that triangle is there. And I'm going to close this triangle up inside R2. Well, what does that mean? That means I'm going to take the intersection over all epsilons greater than zero of this union right here. What is that union right here? Well, I'm going to go through and I'm going to take every single point of my s, and I'm going to take an epsilon ball around that point, and I'm going to union all those things together. Well, and that gets me this kind of thickened triangle here. I've sort of thickened it up by an epsilon neighborhood. And then I'm going to let that epsilon neighborhood go to zero. I'm taking the intersection here, so that epsilon, as it gets smaller, is shrinking down and getting closer and closer and closer to that triangle. But let's think about what's in there. Well, any point that was already in this sort of bulk part of the triangle will certainly still be there. That part's fine. But what about the stuff I said was excluded? I said that this edge wasn't going to be there, and I said that this vertex wasn't going to be there. Well, if I think about this vertex, and I think about any epsilon neighborhood of it, I'm certainly going to get some of these points over here. So that vertex becomes part of my closure. Similarly, for any point along the edge here, well, if I consider an o epsilon neighborhood around that point, I'll certainly pick up points that are inside here. And so that edge will also be part of my triangle, part of this closure. So that means that the closure of this triangle, which is kind of missing some bits, is all nicely filled in now. I have this edge and I have this vertex just as I want it. In R, I can consider the closure of the interval from 0 to 1. I can contemplate the version of that interval where I don't include the endpoints, I include exactly one of the endpoints, or I include both of the endpoints. No matter which of these variants I do, I'm going to end up with the same answer, which is the closed interval from 0 to 1. In Rn, I can do an analogous thing where I look at the set of points whose distance from the origin is strictly less than 1. What happens when I form the closure? Well, all the points that are within 1 of the origin are going to be in that closure, but I'm also going to get some new points, the points that are of distance exactly 1 from the origin. Therefore, this closure becomes this. Let's emphasize, however, that this closure is a relative construction. We aren't always closing up in Rn or R. Sometimes we're closing up in a subspace of Rn or R, such as this, which is the open ray from 0 to infinity. If I close up inside the open ray from 0 to infinity, the open interval from 0 to 1, well, then I'll get 1, because 1 is close to this and 1 is in this set, but I won't get 0, because even though 0 is close to this set, it's not contained in this x. And so the result is that I have the following set, the half open interval, as the closure of this open interval inside this open ray. Now if I close up the open interval inside the open interval itself, something rather peculiar happens. I can't add any new points because whatever this closure is going to be, it has to be a subset of my x. 
because after all, what am I doing? I'm looking at the points of x that are close to my subset. So that means I can't enlarge it at all, but every point that's in the open interval from 0 to 1 is certainly close to it, so I have the open interval from 0 to 1. So let's think about this abstractly. If we contemplate the power set of our set x, this is the set of subsets of x, then we've defined for ourselves an assignment, and that assignment carries a subset s of x to its closure. This is a map from the power set to the power set, and it's called the closure operator on x. Now we turn to an important proposition. The importance of this proposition is that it's going to allow us to contemplate the closure operator without necessarily remembering the notion of distance that we've been using. This proposition is going to isolate the key properties of that closure operator that we're later going to abstract when we speak about topological spaces in general. So let's go ahead. Well, if I have a subset s of x, well then I can consider the points of that subset and I can ask whether they're close to s. And they are in all cases. What's the proof? Well if x is a point of s, then for every epsilon greater than zero, I'd like to try and find a point that's in the epsilon ball around x that intersects with s. But I have such a point, namely x itself. The next key property that we want to identify is that when we form the closure of the empty set, we get again the empty set. Nothing really happens when we close up the empty set. And why is that true? Well, what happens when you unpack this sentence, when you unpack what the closure operator is trying to do to the empty set, you come upon a sentence of the form, there exists an S in the empty set such that something. And in logic, it doesn't matter what that something is. The main point is that any time you have an, an existentially quantified sentence about the empty set, it doesn't matter what blah is, this sentence is always, always false. By the way, similarly, if you had a universally quantified sentence here, instead of an existentially quantified sentence, it wouldn't matter what the blah was, this would always be true. The third property is going to be a little more difficult to prove. What does it say? It says that if we have a finite collection of subsets of x, then I can take the union of those subsets and I can form the closure of it. On the other hand, I can take the closure of each one of these and union those together. The statement is that these two things are actually equal. Let's see how to prove it. The program to prove this is going to be to show that each side is contained in the other. So let's begin with the following situation. If we have a point of x that's close to some si, then for every epsilon greater than zero, there's going to be a point in si whose distance from x is strictly less than epsilon. But since si is contained in the union of all of the si's, that means that I've found a point s such that the distance from x is strictly less than epsilon. In other words, that means that our point x here is actually close to the union. To say it again, what that means is that if you've got a point that's close to si, then you have a point that is close to the union. Now I need to proceed in the other direction, and I need to show that if you have a point that's close to this union, then it's also close to some si. I don't necessarily know which one, it just needs to be close to one of them. So let's see how that goes. Well, if I have x and x, and it's close to the union of these s1 through sn's, then, well, what can I do? For each m, a natural number, I can find a point 
SM of this union such that the distance from X to SM is strictly less than 1 over M. So I have this array of points. This is an infinite array of points, these SMs. I have one of these for every single M, so I have infinitely many of these points. And they all sit inside this union. But if I have an infinite number of points and they're all inside a finite union of SIs, then I have a theorem, which is often called the pigeonhole principle, that says that at least for one of these i's, this set here, the set of SM's that are actually contained in this SI, that must be an infinite set. So if this is an infinite set, then when I think about what happens with my SI's, I can think for every epsilon greater than zero, I can find myself an M by going sufficiently far out in the natural numbers, such that 1 over m is less than epsilon. But if I can ensure that 1 over m is less than epsilon, then I can ensure that the distance from x to sm, which is smaller than 1 over m, is also smaller than epsilon. But now I've ensured that I've got myself a point, sm, which is in si, which is epsilon close to my x. The final thing that we need about our closure operator is the following. If I look at a subset of my x, call it, call it s, I could do something kind of perverse looking. I could start off by taking the closure, but then maybe I could do something strange like taking the closure of the closure. Or maybe I could take the closure of the closure of the closure of the closure. And I could keep going like this. But in fact, I don't ever have to go like this. As soon as I'm closed, I'm closed. That is to say, the closure of the closure is equal to the closure. Let's see why that's true. Well, by the first point that we proved in this proposition, we know that the closure is contained in the closure of the closure. So we have one containment here that will be OK. We have this containment right here. So now we need to prove the other direction, the other containment. And what does that mean? Well, I need to contemplate a point here, and I need to show that it actually lives here. So I'll begin by taking a point x of x that's close to the closure. Then for every single epsilon greater than 0, I can find a point in the closure, t, let's call it, such that the distance from x to t is strictly less than epsilon over 2. And as you'll probably remember from analysis, any time you start to see that something like epsilon over 2 is showing up, then you might expect me to see another epsilon over 2, and maybe I'll be adding them together to give me some epsilon via something like the triangle inequality. And if that was your anticipation, you're absolutely right. That's what we're going to do right now. Since t, this t here, is contained in the closure of s, that means it's close to s. So there exists a point s of s, whose distance from t is strictly less than epsilon over 2 as well. And now, you're exactly right the whole time, the triangle inequality comes in, and the distance from x to t is epsilon over 2, or less than epsilon over 2, and the distance from t to s is less than epsilon over 2, so when I add them together, I get something that's less than epsilon, and so I discover that my distance from x to s, s here is this point of s itself, is strictly less than epsilon, just as we want it. So let's look back through these, these key points in this proposition. The first point in this proposition said that for every subset, S, S is contained in its closure. The second point said that, well, if I take the closure of the empty set, I just recover the empty set. The third point said that the closure operator respects finite unions. That is to say, a finite union of closures is equal to the closure of the finite union. The fourth condition says that for every subset S of X, the closure of the closure equals the closure. Here's a quick corollary for you. And if this corollary doesn't seem so obvious to you, that's OK. But take a moment to reflect on how this follows from the proposition that we've just seen. The closure operator is inclusion preserving.
That is to say, if you have a subset s of t, both subsets of x, then when I close up my s and I close up my t, the closure of s is contained in the closure of t. So now, what's the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that we're going to take subsets of Rn, and in a little while we'll take even more general sets, but right now we're just going to think about subsets of Rn, and we're going to equip them with the information of this closure operator. And that's going to be what we call a subspace. So a subspace x of Rn is a subset of Rn, along with the closure operator that we defined. That's the only piece of structure I want to remember about my x. I don't care how far points are from one another in x necessarily. The only information that I want to retain about my x is the question of whether or not a point is close or not to a given subset. And if I have that information, then I consider that complete information about this subspace. So another way of saying this is that a subspace, x of Rn, is a subset along with the corresponding idea of closeness. Let's look at some examples. The most important example is that of the spheres. The n-dimensional sphere is the set of points in Rn plus 1 whose distance from the origin is exactly 1. So we can begin with the zero sphere. That's a little silly maybe because there's only two points, minus 1 and plus 1, and S0 is just the set consisting of those two points. S1 is rather more interesting. The one sphere, or circle, is the set of points of distance 1 from the origin inside R2. The two-sphere is the set of points x, y, z in R3 such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. The three-sphere, you can see I can just keep going this way, the three-sphere consists of the set of points w, x, y, z in R4, such that w squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Now you've noticed I haven't drawn a picture of this, and you might be a little concerned by that. But in fact, it is indeed possible to visualize the three-sphere. And one of the key things that we're going to be doing is developing enough topology so that we can have access to an interesting object like the three-sphere, and we can really study it. The torus, however, which is the next example, T2, is something that we have access to. The set of points in R4 such that u squared plus v squared equals 1, and x squared plus y squared is also equal to 1. It looks like this. It's the surface of a donut. This is a special case of a more general construction that we'll be doing a lot of interesting things with. Well, I think they're interesting. If we have a collection of subspaces, we don't just have to have one. We have an x1 sitting inside Rn1, x2 inside Rn2, etc., etc., up to xk sitting inside Rnk. Then, well, we can define a subspace, which is called the product x1 through xk. These are the points x1 in Rn1, x2 in Rn2, etc., etc., such that xi is in xi. This is a subspace of R n1 plus n2 plus n3 dot dot dot. So this is a subspace of this sort of big Euclidean space here. In this example of the torus here, what did I do? Well, I took the torus and I got that by taking S1, the one sphere or circle, and crossing it with S1, the one sphere or circle. Oh, hi. Well, that's it for the day. Next time we'll talk about open sets and closed sets, 
and we'll talk about continuity. All right, thanks for stopping by.